Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. In today's video, I'm going to show you 10 things that I had wrong about personality psychology and what I've learned from my studies of personality psychology over the past decade. Starting with number one, we are born with one personality. So I often used to believe that your personality could already be seen in your childhood, in your infancy. As a baby, it was already set and uh, you know, nothing that happened to you would have any influence on your personality or who you came to be. You already had one set personality, one core self, you know. And what I learned over time was that that was actually not true. So what I started learning was that actually, no, when you interview people, listen to people, introspect with people, you recognize that, yes, people's experiences do shape how and who they become and how they develop over time. So you can't trace your personality down to your childhood or to your earliest years. Though, of course, such a study can be very interesting. It can show you a lot about how you started out and where you, how, where you begun. It can't explain the full scope of your personality or how you came to develop as a person. Number two, we only have one personality. So. A lot of the time we tend to work with the idea that people have one set personality that they embody all the time in every single situation. But in many ways, personality does seem to be the result of uh, our personal interactions with other people, which means that most people tend to have more than one persona, more than one personality, depending on where they are and who they are with. I tend to study people in four situations. Number one, when they're alone by themselves. Number two, during hobbies and recreational activities. Number three, in social settings with friends and family members. Of course, in these situations, your personality can change and you can act differently depending on who you're with. And number four, at your job. Because of course, at your job, you're paid to serve a certain role and play a certain kind of person. You have your customer service voice when you work in customer service. And I have my YouTube voice when I speak on YouTube. Now, that means that we shouldn't just be tracking and trying to figure out which one personality describes us in every single situation, but rather we should work with an inventory of a few personalities that we seem to border or neighbor or switch between, and we should be tracking in which situations we tend to manifest which personality traits and which behaviors. Number three, personality is in our very DNA. Yeah, for the longest time I believed personality was purely genetic, but nowadays I tend to have a more balanced opinion. Nowadays I tend to believe that parts of your personality and your starting point is certainly shaped by your DNA, your upbringing, your genetics, your parents. And I do believe that we are a lot more alike our parents than we like to believe. Most of us have inherited personal traits from our mother, father, grandparents. And if you look at and study them, even though you can be and have grown to be very different from them, you certainly have similar inclinations and tendencies. You just learn to express them and manifest them a little bit differently. Number four, our personality is our most dominant trait. When I was younger and started out with MBTI, I was very interested in, you know, the most dominant quality of a person, you know, the most stereotypical, normal version of an INFJ or an INTP or an ESTP. But here I was only focused on the surface. When you study only the dominant function, you study only the surface of a person. And the surface of the person is only a small percentage of a person's true personality. And the person can just as well be defined by their inferior functions or less developed traits as they can by their dominant traits. And you can choose to focus on different qualities. You can describe a person both from their positive and how they see themselves and what they have learned to do well, but you can also describe a person by what they don't do and what they struggle with and what they could do better. Number five, the idea that personality is something absolute or singular, right? So a lot of the time we ask ourselves, am I a nice person? Am I an extrovert? Am I an introvert? And here we often compare ourselves to other people. I'm not as extroverted as that guy, or I'm not as introverted as that person. But the truth is, personality is not really a one or zero answer. You can't really say, I'm an extrovert, and then assume that you're going to be like every single extrovert that you meet. You can't assume that just because you're an introvert, you're going to be an introvert in every single situation, with every single person, and in the exact same way that every other introvert is an introvert, right? And so instead of looking at it as an absolute fixed thing, try to see it as a spectrum. And so from this, what you want to do is you want to look at the nuances. Yes, 
I'm about this extroverted or I'm about this introverted. I'm introverted in these situations. I tend to be more outspoken when it comes to these areas or these hobbies or these interests. Number six, I used to believe that personality was who we were in a flow state. So the idea was that we had this dominant state that we were simply better at than anything else. And then we have these lesser archetypes and personalities that we could certainly do, but we couldn't really find flow in these things and they were inherently stressful. But the more I started improving on my inferior functions, the more I started realizing that I could find enjoyment and happiness and flow in these activities as well. And flow instead of thinking of flow as uh, being in the dominant state of passion and doing something you're great at, a lot of the time it seems to be that flow is about a state of balance and full embodiment of yourself. Number seven, we can measure personality using neuroscience. With this, I used to believe that if we could put an EEG cap on a person and measure their brain waves, we would know what kind of a personality they were. And I thought, I hoped that uh, people with EEG caps would be able to answer these questions once and for all. But over time, I realized that the only thing neuroscience will do is it will show us which brain waves we activate in certain areas. It will give an additional perspective, sure. It will tell us some interesting things about us, definitely. But it still won't explain what personality is. That's a question we'll have to balance through a mix of mechanical studies and genetic reading and DNA mapping and uh, neuroscience imaging, but also through self-reporting. Because we're still going to have to ask people, what happens? What do you feel when these areas of your brain light up? What are you experiencing when you are doing this activity? What happens when you're using this part of the brain? What are you currently experiencing? So it's going to have to be a mix of self-reporting and neuroscience, not purely neuroscience, not purely science. Number eight, only an outside observer can see your true self. And this is something I see a lot of people believe that only other people can describe you accurately because only other people can see the true you and you will always be biased. You will always be limited. You'll always see a part of yourself, right? What I've come to learn is that actually people tend to know themselves best. Certainly people can get their personality types wrong, meaning that they can uh, misunderstand certain parts of what they are doing and so on. But in general, you as an inside observer will have the most full and comprehensive picture of who you are, meaning you will know all the experiences, you will have all the memories, you will have all the data, you will have lived an entire life inside yourself. So in a way, you're the most qualified to say who you are, but other people can certainly give you an interesting point of view and feedback on certain things. And certainly they can show you and give you an alternative take on what you're doing. It's a mix of self-reporting, a mix of self-introspection, a mix of thinking and writing and journaling, but also talking with and discussing with other people. I tend to feel that way. Do you notice that in me? I tend to say I'm like this. Do you see that in what I tend to do? You know, like these kind of questions can foster an important dialogue that can help you learn more about yourself, how you act, how you think, and what you're really doing. Number nine, such an expert, an outside observer, could determine your personality by just watching a 60 minute interview of you or watching a video of you online. Lots of people believe that you can figure out somebody's personality in just 60 seconds just by looking at them. And certainly I've done this. I've gone out and I've tested and tried it out and I've definitely uh, had a lot of fun like trying to guess people's personalities and it's a fun thing to do. But certainly I would never say with 100% certainty that I was correct. I always feel like there's more to learn about a person and the longer I spend time with somebody the more qualities and nuances I see on top of just what they can show me in a 60 minute video where they might be in a certain mood where they might be showing only certain parts of themselves where they might be in a certain mental state when you spend longer times with people you start to see their complexities and nuances and of course these nuances cannot be described by just one personality. A lot of the time you need to bend and stretch definitions because when we're dealing with personality, we can't hope to find exact 100% perfect answers. In reality, what we should be looking for is 70% or 80% correct answers. You know, things that seem to be generally true, but certainly not always true because that's what we are. That's what it means to be human. Humans are not 100% one way or 100% the other way. 
humans are complicated and have a lot of contradictions and a lot of layers to their personality. Number 10. I used to believe that the MBTI was the best system and that the Big Five and other systems were simply inferior models. Nowadays, I tend to be system agnostic, which means that I can see that different personality inventories focus on different perspectives of your personality. What I find is that the MBTI certainly works better for a person, a normal person, a layman's person, trying to understand themselves through exploration and insight. And the archetypes and the traits and the tests of the MBTI are often focused on your values and preferences, which means that they focus on a certain part of your personality, the part of your personality that has a certain intention, a certain set of values and a certain set of preferences. The big five, on the other hand, focuses more on your lifestyle, your concrete behavior, what you tend to do and how you tend to act and how that tends to compare to other people. And certainly the big five is more reductive in its model. It's more specific, it's more falsifiable, it's more tangible, it's more measurable. And certainly that can be very useful in terms of if you're a psychologist or if you're trying to gain an accurate map or reading of another person or a comparison for another person. But the MBTI can certainly be useful if you're interested in understanding your own values, your thought processes and your feelings and why you tend to do what you tend to do. And certainly while these traits are not 100% exact or accurate or scientific, they can still trigger a lot of introspection and insight and exploration and that can be very helpful for you in order to gain a better sense of who you are. So yeah, those are the 10 things that I've discovered about personality psychology. There's certainly more to add here. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching and see you all in the next video.